about? Well, uh, welcome again, uh, just to introduce myself uh, also to Greece. <laughs> My name is Alexander Ren. I'm a journalist uh, in uh, Germany, Hamburg. I'm working for um, the public radio stations over here. And, well, it's uh, me to do the moderation this evening for the first part uh, of uh, our debate event. Uh, after that, I will pass over to my colleague, George Kokolis in uh, Greece, and he will moderate the second part. Um, well, yes, um, welcome. I'm uh, glad that you all found a way over here. And uh, um, yes, uh, you all know um, austerity, virtue, or downfall is um, what we are going to discuss or debate today, um, a topic which is uh, or has become well, uh, more up to date uh, recently when um, the Greek government decided to close the broadcast station to save more money. So, um, well, another another um, another point that the topic is uh, very actual and we should discuss or debate. So it's. Um, just uh, me to give you uh, a small introduction what will happen today. Um, we got four speakers and um, we will have uh, like one hour, one hour and a half more or less. Um, and uh, yeah, we will have uh, both positions, meaning uh, austerity virtue and austerity downfall on both sides. So um, we got two German speakers. You can see them here, and uh, I will introduce them later. And we get two speakers in uh, Greece as well. And um, for balancing the whole uh, discussion, um, we got um, yeah the opposition over here and the proposition over here in Germany, and the same in Greece. Well, um, we start uh, or before we start with uh, our first uh, speech. Um, yeah, I would uh, love uh, to give uh, the voice to uh, my colleague from the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Greece, uh, Susanna Vogt. She uh, is working for the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung um, since years, like two, uh, since 2006 and since 2012, I guess. Um, she is yeah, the head of the Greece office of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. And, um, well, she will give you um, another introduction in uh, what uh, you are awaiting this evening. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, you're kind of debating. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you as well. And um, in the name of the Adnar Stiftung, to the kickoff debate of the dialogue without border. So, I welcome very warmly the audience, audience here in. in uh, and, uh, in Hamburg as well as our virtual guests who are following us uh, via the live stream which is made available of this debate. And I would also like to welcome both our very distinguished speakers in Hamburg and here in, in Patra. So this is uh, the first of our series of debates the Conrad Adenauer system together with IDEA uh, Invasion Application in London uh, is, is organizing and from this very first debate we chose a very crispy title. I have already mentioned it, Austerity, Virtue of Downfall. So, and, and it is needed uh, a, a title on which we have very distinguished uh, opinions, and it is needed, needed in, in debating. Um, obviously, the austerity note in many European countries has become one which is not a particularly positive one, uh, a, mention, a notion that is meant, uh, like in many things, scholarly, like memorandum or measures. Um, but I think that we will also hear uh, tonight is, is like the concept of solidarity, uh, um, a concept which is, is rather complex and worth uh, explaining and which goes just beyond uh, saving money, obviously. So today's uh, event is about debating, about changing arguments and not cliches, and about countering arguments and not cliches. For this, we chose a very special format. So obviously already working the life debate between countries, two countries, and these countries not coincidentally are Greece and Germany, as the relations between these two countries have already seen better times. So the setup about this one idea is to have two countries, two cities, one topic, two positions, and two positions being present on both sides. 
and interconnected by technology, which is also a premier for us uh, in this case. Why we are doing this? Actually, our intent is to contradict the mainstream, especially media coverage uh, we have seen in, in the last years, in order to show that actually positions and arguments are not linked cliche-wise to country or an origin, so uh, are linked um, to, to positions which are present on both sides, be it in Greece or in Germany, and they have to stand the argumentation on both sides. It's actually as simple as this. This is also why we are here at Konrad Adenauer Stiftung uh, present again in, in Greece. Our target is, as this evening shows, to facilitate dialogue, in particular between Greece and Germany, but also between other uh, European uh, member countries, uh, European partner states, and to give people, also as simply as it is, the chance to talk with each other. And I think, especially tonight, when having this live, real technology link debate between Greece and Germany, we are doing it like, quite a practical example of, of this kind of work. Our office we opened in Athens yeah, last year, May, and since uh, then we have been engaging various projects, um, working a lot with journalists from Greece and Germany, with young entrepreneurs, with startups from Greece and Germany, and uh, overall with uh, stakeholders of the political dialogue we are engaging in and here for. So we are very happy to co-house host this uh, first, first debate, as I said, that is also a kick-off event for the Debating Society of Greece, so then we are very proud to be, to be part of this. Um, I would like to thank um, the, the Debate Society for their support in setting up this event, as well as our partner IDEA uh, in London, and the colleagues from Kant in Hamburg. And I wish you all and us all a very enriching discussion, and I'm happy to pass over to Manos Mokopoulos from IDEA to also share some words with you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Milana. Yeah, and now let's uh, let us uh, give uh, the voice to uh, Idea, the organization. Who, uh, yeah, is the other partner in this project. Thank you very much, Alexander, and thank you all for coming here in Madras and in Hamburg. Uh, as has already been mentioned, I work for the International Debate Education Association, an international network of debate organizations that works in over 70 countries and over 50 languages. What we believe in is that dialogue helps create informed citizens, creates active citizens, and also creates open and open societies. But one of the things that we are very proud of is our work in Europe and the work that we do towards getting Europeans to talk to one another. Not only talk to one another, but also take action, as we are also one of the founding members together, uh, together with the European Youth Forum of the League of Young Voters in Europe that we launched uh, a couple of weeks ago in Brussels and to get young people more involved with the European process. In this particular case, the continuing of the competition that we've done over the past decades of bringing um, populations of groups of people that are seemingly at conflict with each other, but they're not being at conflict with each other, to talk to one another. In this case, we thought that this will be one of many debates where we get Europeans to talk to one another, using modern technology, getting people from different auditoriums together to speak, or evenings like this one, to make sure that they understand that the challenges are served and the source should be the future. And the only way that they can actually make decisions about these is through informed discussion that transcends national borders. Thank you very much once again for coming. I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to Radio Mock, who is uh, the organization that is live streaming this event, Peter from Hamburg and Patras, and also the debate side of Greece here that's being so lovely hosts in the city of Patras that has provided us with this wonderful venue. Thank you very much, Maros. Um, and before we start uh, with our speeches, um, let me just explain you once again the rules. Each of you, each of our four speakers, has only six minute, minutes to develop their arguments, their statements, uh, pro or contra austerity. Um, after we've heard all of uh, those four speakers, um, we will uh, well watch um, some other statements. We will link uh, to us by video, and uh, of course, then because we will we are going to get into contact and into interaction. Of course, there's uh, some time, some space for questions from the audience, and uh, 
yeah, you can just put another question um, to whoever you want to of our four speakers. So, um, well, I guess um, we should start uh, with uh, our first uh, speaker, which is Carsten Owens. Uh, I'd like to introduce him. Uh, Carsten Owens um, is uh, the Hamburg State Chairman of the Junge Union, which is the youth organization um, of the Christian Democratic Union and the Christian Social Union in Bavaria. Um, well, um, he has joined uh, this political area in 2003, and Carsten has uh, studied um, business administration in Hamburg and in Sydney, I guess. Um, so he's got an international context, and he has worked for more than five years, um, I think, in the business um, development and consulting area in uh, several international and especially European companies. Um, and of course, uh, he has done uh, some research. He's uh, working at a music university lecturer right now and is engaged in uh, several economic and political organizations. So. He has a, a wide experience concerning um, reality and theory of uh, European uh, economic development. Um, so um, he is going to be the first proposition speaker. So um, he will tell us why austerity is virtue. And so I pass over to you, Carsten, and uh, uh, it's your turn now. Very well. It's quite loud. Um, thank you very much, first of all, for this uh, warm introduction. And um, yes, it's a pleasure of being here today at Seals Law School. Um, not the very first time, but the first time that I'm speaking here in English. So um, a new experience for myself as well. And um, a warm welcome as well to our friends in Greece. So happy um, to, to well have this discussion today. And I think it's a great opportunity for all of us. So thanks at the very end, of course, to the to organizations, Konrad Adenland Stiftung, the idea for setting up this event and giving us all this opportunity to discuss austerity. Austerity is a necessity for economic growth. Um, austerity is what we should, on the other hand, better call the process of household consolidation. Um, last night, um, Chancellor Merkel in Berlin just made that very clear. Because what means austerity actually? She pointed out like three years. Um, uh, in the past, uh, she, she wasn't even clear what this word actually means. So talking about household consolidation, this makes it quite easier to understand what we are talking about. And it doesn't sound that negative or maybe even threatening um, if we're not talking about austerity, this um, new word, but uh, rather about household consolidation. So this process of consolidation of national households is actually an absolute condition for sustainable economic growth. A condition to protect the wealth of our nations and a condition uh, to protect um, as well the, for these wealth for the um, future and coming generations. So, um, as I said, we need household consolidation in order to keep the flexibility of governments. Because if we um, take the city of Hamburg as an example, uh, just about 10% of the annual budget is just to cover the interest rates of our debts. So these 10%, we could actually use this money to finance infrastructure, to finance um, kindergartens, schools, or universities, um, or just to finance our social systems. So a smart government should act like every one of us would do. The city of Hamburg has to pay uh, roughly 10% of its annual budget just to cover the interest rate for the debts the city made over the last um, couple of decades. So this 10% we could use to finance infrastructure, to build schools, kindergartens or universities, and of course to fund our social systems. So a smart government should actually be able to act like every one of us. In good times, you save some money, and in, in uh, well bad times, you just have these extra savings. We should better talk not about the word austerity, which seems to be quite cryptic and nobody really knows what it actually means. And um, even Chancellor Merkel pointed that out just yesterday evening in Berlin. So we should rather talk about household consolidation. So, I'm talking about household consolidation, and having said that, um, it is the same with all things um, or measures, even though um, meant to be used too much, maybe too much. But where is the limit? And how can we actually avoid to save ourselves to death? Good. Um, as I said before, um, it could be an option to follow a strategy of deficit spending, thus to lend money in order to finance um, the state spendings. 
in the short run, this could usually um, increase the scope of possibilities for the government. However, in the long run, growing deficit always, a growing deficit always restricts the options to act. So in addition, we all know that in practice, once promised budgets are listed in hard to cut any drum, even though it sounds easy and logical and poorly. The problem in Greece, though, was not a temporary cyclical downfall of the economy, but a structural problem. So, therefore, lending money, and more and more and more money, actually did not help or improve the situation, but to make things even worse over years. For the last 10 years, the national debt of, of Greece has grown from about 100% of the GDP in 2002 up to more than 160% of the GDP by 2011. So, and at the same time, the Greek economy had some very successful years, at least um, until the global financial crisis in 2009, on which the government, uh, nonetheless, could not capitalize. So, by today, and um, I mean, it is not on us to blame anybody, but it's just important that we actually look at the um, facts, that we look at the statistics, and by today we know that at the beginning of the uh, euro, uh, Greece did actually not meet the convergence criteria in, 2000, in 1999, and it should have not been allowed in the very first time to join the euro in 2001. The expansive household economic policy, rising wages, an increase in state finance jobs, um, and about 10% of what we know today um, of the country's jobs are actually state paid jobs. And some other problems increased the structural prices in Greece. However, as said, in particular as Germans, it is not on us to blame anybody, neither a whole country uh, nor its politicians, or any other uh, ones in Greece for not acting much earlier. We didn't do anything beforehand as well, helping the country and seeing that we actually have a structural problem. So, however, as I said, we need to analyze the facts and we need to make sure two important things. The first one, how can we stabilize the Greek economy to improve the situation for the people? And the second point, how can we ensure the situation so hard for the whole country and its people but like we face it these days in Greece, is never ever happening again, neither in Greece nor anywhere else in Europe. Since 2010, the Greek government has made some very remarkable reforms and progress to improve the structural challenges um, of the country. And this directly affects people getting paid less or even losing their jobs, of course. In a vicious circle, people are then spending less thus small businesses like restaurants, supermarkets or anything else are earning less and can themselves spend less money. So we have a visual circuit, vicious circle today and um, the government in, in Greece and Athens as well in, as in Brussels and in Berlin are thinking and trying to find options what we can actually do. It's totally understandable that people are protesting against the reforms um, uh, completed these days and as Germans we would probably do the same. So such hard reforms um, undertaken in such a short period of time. So luckily, we have set the political agenda around 10 years ago, so that by today, we are in the confident situation of not having um, these circumstances and having, therefore, a strong economy without mass unemployment. But therefore, with respect and with dignity, we should support the Greek reforms. Looking at the fiscal perspective, it is expected that the country will end this year with a budget surplus of 2% of the GDP. A great success, in particular if compared with a budget deficit of roughly 15% in 2009. Uh, the unit labor costs are decreasing, the confidence in the Greek economy is actually returning. So in the future, the Greek government should continue with its structural reforms, privatize state-owned companies, fight corruption and black markets. Further, the government should attract new businesses to Greece. The energy sector, the tourism sector, and the education sector do have a lot of potential therefore. And along with the reduction of national debt, the Greek government, the Greek government should uh, then re regain flexibility to act. And as said at the beginning, austerity, so meaning household consolidation, is a necessity for economic growth. We need to keep the flexibility of um, the um, state um, of, of the governments and Germany, in this particular case, should support these efforts as a friend and as a very close partner.
Okay. I hope uh, you can actually understand this now. So, how do we continue? Is it, should I try it once again with a microphone? Or? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes? Okay. So, it was you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. So, thank you very much, Carsten, um, uh, for your statement. And uh, thank you for, for your patience until it worked. Um, so, uh, I guess uh, now we can uh, yeah, just switch over to our next speaker. And as I told you, um, we will now change uh, the location and we will now hear um, the second speaker who is uh, located in uh, in Greece. Um, so I'd love to introduce to you um, Philippa Rastis Tarbo. I hope I did pronounce this. Uh, I mean, uh, correct. <laughs> I tried. I tried to learn it. Thank you very much. <laughs> so um, uh, Philippa <laughs> uh, is uh, a lawyer, and uh, she is uh, has a PhD in political science. Um, she is uh, working as a researcher and project coordinator at an, uh, an organization called Ilia Map, which is an independent, non-profit organization um, well, focused on a, on a policy-oriented research and training, and especially, of course, in the, the field of European integration and uh, international relations. And uh, well, given uh, the fact that her main research takes place in these areas, that she has a, a lot of knowledge uh, about political systems um, on, uh, on the one hand in the administrative area and on the other one um, in uh, yeah, the, social, uh, the social area because she has a competence in, uh, in law and in political science. Um, well, she as well uh, has a wide, uh, wide experience um, to now give us her statement why um, austerity means downfall and opposing austerity. So I pass over to you, Philippa. It's your turn. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here and to be here today. So, uh, my comments uh, will be more focused to the political and legal consequences of the austerity method and not so in the uh, only economic side. I um, will try to explain to you very shortly uh, what is the, this political rationality uh, that stands behind austerity. Um, okay, in my view, the real crisis is uh, not a kind of economic crisis, as we are used to say uh, since uh, a couple of years now. In fact, I think that we are witnessing the rise of authoritarian, subnational neoliberalism. And this is a kind of uh, new model uh, of conducting policies in Europe. And uh, I'll try to explain to you what this means, what is this rise of authoritarian, subnational neoliberalism. Historically speaking, since the Treaty of Rome, in fact, the European Union has been developed on the basis of three principles, common principles. The first one was economic liberalism, of course, very much influenced by the German vision. There is no doubt about that during all the history of European integration. The second principle is democracy, and the third is the Rule of law, as to say, okay. What is happening today? We have this rise of, as I said, authoritarian, subnational, neoliberal, small. And this means that there is a disruption, in my view, between these three principles, these three founding principles. In fact, there is a real danger to have a complete disconnection between the European economic model, democracy, and the rule of law. So this is the real crisis, not the simple economic crisis or financial crisis. And this crisis challenges seriously the very nature of the European integration process. Now, how does this happen? We have three phenomena that coexist. The first one, I call it a splitting Europe. 
uh, what makes the split in Europe. For a long time, the, the grand promise of the candidates was that the EU is a project of inclusive integration of the United States. Uh, well, there is a historical fact here also. Uh, in fact, the European integration process followed mainly uh, the market expanding based on liberalization and, de and deregulation. And this, uh, this logic, this market expanding logic, in fact, didn't facilitate enough the inclusive integration of all European states. But now we have also this new crisis huh, of, uh, as I said before, this rise of a kind of uh, authoritarian neoliberalism model. And this crisis, in fact, exacerbates uh, um, uh, this logic, this market-based logic, even more. So we have this phenomenon of splitting growth, which means that the already existing asymmetrical interdependence between European states, that we, this means the fact that we have states that are very strong and others that are very weak, this interdependence that was already asymmetrical, in fact, is exacerbated. And this is very, very serious thing to take into account. What means this phenomenon of splitting? This means that there is no space for reciprocal, reciprocal horizontal cooperation between states based on the mutuality of interests from all states. So what is the receipt? The receipt is has two directions. The first one is severe structural adjustment policies at state level for European states. And the second dimension is national expansionist commercial force at international level. And this is what exactly Germany um, tries to do. Okay? Germany uses the European Union as a platform in order to reinforce uh, uh, the national expansion of commercial policy. So the second phenomenon oh, after the, the split in Europe is what I call a techno Europe. So here we have uh, an phenomenon that's also very, very serious to take into account. The fact that we have a European Europe that uh, now enters into a new period of regulatory expansion. But here there is no political uh, legitimacy. Uh, expansion. So, as Germany uh, wanted to do, and in fact, uh, he succeeded very, uh, Germany succeeded very well to do that, is to, to use the European Commission uh, as a technological tool more and more. In fact, France uh, doesn't like uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, perspective, but for the moment, concede uh, and uh, uh, follows the German plan. And so we have a reinforcement of the European Commission, of the European Central Bank, and we have a development of other regulatory bodies uh, with regard to the coordination by the head of our heads. Um, so here there is, in fact, a uh, uh, hypertrophy of norms, rules, institutions, and mechanisms, authorities, but there is no political dimension. And now, the, the third phenomenon that is interlinked with the, the, uh, the, uh, the second one, second one, is what I call a fast track Europe. This means that there is a kind of reconfiguration of the European Union into a fragile political and legal system. What, what is the meaning of that? In fact, all European decisions related to the economic governance are taken within European countries in a cycle. Why the European Parliament and National Parliament have a secondary role? So here there is a serious threat to the integrity of the European legal order, but also uh, this situation might undermine the rule of law at the national level. And we saw that in the case of the Greek protest uh, terrorists uh, last days, uh, exactly that this uh, this issue uh, this issue was uh, very very crucial. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philippa. This was just in time. <laughs>
And uh, well, so we've heard uh, our first two speakers, and uh, now I will give the pass over um, to my colleague in uh, Greece, to George. I can't see you at the moment, but uh, it's your turn now to moderate the, the second part and uh, to introduce our uh, third and fourth uh, speakers. Thank you very much for the coordination of the first part. Uh, we'll move to the second part. Uh, I have a, a second proposition speech by Omer Zatos. Hello, can you see me now? Okay, so we'll move to the second part. Uh, from the proposition in the States, we have uh, Omer Sapolos, the political scientist and the uh, scientific uh, associate with the Ministry of Defense, who is going to give us uh, more details on why we should support the state of the Congress. Uh, so, thank you very much for this kind of presentation. Uh, I will try to explain the state in terms more of political science than from the postmodern problems. So, I will try to explain it from, from that side. Uh, I tried to start an uh, examination of state into three discrete levels. The first one is the economic, the second one is the political, the last one is the moral level. So, first about the economic level. For the majority of people, austerity means cuts, just cuts. I think that we would say about draconian cuts. It means cuts in the salaries, pensions, extremely strict fiscal control, reduction of the general budget, less money for social purposes. Generally, that is something true. These are the main measures of the government which follow an austerity policy, but this could also be interpreted in a different way. Austerity would be the only way for a society to, cons to consume what it produces. It is the cornerstone in the way of thinking. I think that is a kind of political philosophy, also an economic and economic philosophy as well. In fact, it is the only way to produce without borrowing money, without transferring fiscal obligations to the future. It is the only way to create economic growth based on your own power. So, in terms of economy, Austerity is placed exactly in the center of the socio-economic uh, viability. In a globalized free market system, a country needs to survive in a way that a company does, if this country has fiscal problems. So, if a company cannot satisfy its borrowing needs, it shuts down, so simply. But a country, it goes to bankrupt. In order to avoid this terrible situation, there is only one way, austerity to consume what we produce, and if we can, to put aside a small amount of money in case of emergency for the next years. Many examples will be found about how austerity helped a number of European countries so as to face their fiscal problems and get more people to go. Estonia is one of them, Sweden also, of course Germany. Germany is the case study for me of how a country can combine austerity policy with social protection and development. Germany faced seriously their fiscal and labor problems. The political parties decided to cooperate and implement, with some only differentiations, a strict austerity program for many years, which led, which led to spectacular results for the German society. And uh, we should not forget that Germany, that what Germany suggests now for all Europe, has already been implemented in Germany. Austerity was the main tool for them and we must not forget it. Now, regarding the second level, the political level, a country cannot act as an autonomous player in the national level if it has a high problem of fiscal imbalances. Austerity could solve this problem and it could create the preconditions for a country like Greece, for instance, to gain credibility, to protect its international interests, to nas the, its uh, national sovereignty, and of course, its dynamic presence in the EU. How just without borrowing extra money? If you stop borrowing money in order to balance your budget, then you are not affected or addicted to foreign powers to survive. You can create your own foreign policy without caring what your lenders suggest or demand. No country with serious fiscal problems and with so big borrowing obligations could survive in an international environment of multi-level antagonism without a mixture of austerity policy. 
Hostility gives a genuine answer to this necessity. Last but not least is the moral level. And I think that this is the most important. It has to do with the moral obligations a government should have regarding the next generations. As I mentioned before, you cannot borrow money in order to have a superficial prosperity now by transferring the fiscal obligations to the next generation in the future. Nobody who is not even born at that moment is obliged to pay the loans of somebody who borrowed unreasonably, without consistency, without sensitivity, in order to enjoy a greedy life, a life to be or to be re-elected or to satisfy his political audience. It is the worst behavior, I think, between generations. And this is totally unfair. To conclude, nobody supports the idea that austerity could solve the economic, political, and fiscal problems of the country by its own. Austerity must be confined, A, with social protection measures, especially for the weaker section of society, and B, with development policy of attracting foreign investments or focusing on the innovations and the comparative advantages of each society in order to succeed. Otherwise, austerity by itself will create more problems than solve them. For me, austerity is a way of thinking. It's a way of how society could survive based on its own powers and respecting at the same time the next generations. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it was a good speech and very good questions. Um, we move now to Mr. Patrick Sherpa, who's the chairman of the Union Socialite List in Hamburg. Uh, I think I pronounced it. Yes, sir. Yes, yes okay. uh, sir. <laughs> we need some more uh, arguments against the austerity. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let me please start on telling you uh, on what I agree, which is that indeed we in the West have a problem with too much debt in our countries, and that's yes, that we do have to tackle and attack the, uh, the debt crisis and have to get to the very grid of it. The issue we are talking about, however, is how we are going to fix it, and by what means, especially the countries in Southern Europe, uh, should go about it. So, uh, since the motion we are talking about today, can you hear me? All right. So, since the motion we are talking about today is um, whether austerity uh, austerity is a virtue or a downfall, I would use my uh, like to use my time as well to tell you why I think that the pure approach of fiscal entrenchment and austerity is wrong for economic reasons, for political reasons, and for moral reasons as well. Now, um, I am not demonizing austerity in general. Even the most uh, spending addicted Keynesianist would agree that uh, in times of growth and economic success, a country should focus on its budget and it should act uh, fiscally sustainable. But this is not the situation we are facing in the moment in the Eurozone. Proposi uh, proposing austerity in a time of recession carries the risk of worsening it by strangulating the economy from both sides, the demanding and the supplying side. What we have experienced in Spain and Greece so far is that on the demanding side, higher taxes, lower wages and huge unemployment have smashed the purchasing power, while on the other hand, there is no capital to build up the economy since even the healthiest businesses cannot get any credit or, uh, or any investments from the financial markets. Additionally, because of the weakened economy, tax revenues go down, which forces governments to, do, to cut even more spending, leading to the vicious circle that Carsten spoke of. Now, I agree that there is need for structural reform, and yes, we did that in Germany, but those reforms take time, and they cannot be undertaken without compensation for uh, during the time they need to work. Germany implemented these reforms 10 years ago, and during the first years, our deficit actually went up, causing us to receive the so-called blue letters from Brussels, which everybody here in this room uh, can remember. It was not until 2007 that Germany was in a position to significantly lower its deficit, but today, indeed, Germany is stronger again, also because of this patience and the same relaxed approach that I urge us to show towards the countries in Southern Europe. 
Um, but austerity is not only damaging our economy, it is also leading people into, uh, into poverty and thereby threatening our democracy. Youth unemployment rates higher than 50%, wages cut by over 40% and all the other harsh effects lead to despair and hopelessness and at the same point people start losing trust in their governments and more importantly in their government's ability to solve the actual problem. And they also lose trust into the whole political system, which is even more devastating since Spain and Greece, for example, have been ruled by dictators until the mid-1970s. We experience the rise of xenophobia, we experience the rise of nationalism, and the success of many extremist parties, while at the same point we risk the disintegration of Europe. Now, I admit that a more relaxed approach on debt is challenging as well, especially in the so-called creditor countries like Germany. Um, and yes, there is skepticism. But we must not surrender ourselves and let those debates be hijacked by populism and stereotypes. And there is a chance to get active. Even in Germany, the vast majority still thinks that the EU is a good idea and that we should stick with the Euro. And that is because people know that more European integration is needed to maintain our global role in the world, uh, which is becoming more and more bipolar again, with this time with China being the second superpower. What I am saying is, destabilize one part of our continent and you will weaken Europe as a whole. Finally, let me look at the biggest victims and therefore uh, at the moral approach on austerity, the youth. Every historic example of austerity has shown us that its most terrible product was a lost generation. I mentioned the over 50% unemployed young people, and those people aren't stupid. Many of them are highly educated and willing to perform, but their only option is to emigrate and leave their country's future alone. And what kind of future is that? A lack of infrastructure, an underfinanced educational system, a debt industry. Pretty heavy consequences they have to face for mistakes that have been made in a time they were not yet even born. Europe as a whole has an obligation to help them and to show solidarity. But by only forcing their countries to practice austerity, we are letting especially these young people down and therefore I think austerity is also wrong for moral reasons. Thank you very much indeed. Hello friends from the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, congratulations on your initiative on today's debate. My name is Konstantinos Kiranakis, I am the president of YEP, the Youth of the European People's Party, which is the largest political youth organization in Europe. I apologize for not being there today with you, but it is for a good reason. This week the EU Council will discuss and decide on youth unemployment measures, but we are here with our team doing our best to convince the EU leaders and the members of the European Parliament to stand with us on our proposals for job creation. Six million young jobless in Europe need our help. And actually, what we are doing here, the problems that we have to face today, especially as young people, is very much connected to what you are discussing there. Today. The fact that the best educated generation of all times in the world cannot find jobs is a result of a very bad policy, the policy of massive, endless, irresponsible public spending. Things in the economy are much simpler than we think. National economies, same as small families, need to function, plan and spend based on the budget. If a family does not do that, then they will not be able to pay for the fundamental needs, the rent, the food, the electricity. And if the father decides to borrow in order to be able to spend more than he earns, it will probably be his child and his grandchild that will have to pay. This is exactly what happens now in Europe. Because of responsible spending of some generations, our generation has to pay for a problem that we did not create. Because we understand the responsibility that we have as a generation. And as we know that nothing good will come out, no result will come out from blaming another generation, we are ready to fix things. This is why we're here in Brussels these days, to fix things. We said to all the leaders that we met, that we are a generation that believes in the ability of Europeans to create, to grow, to prosper. We want to rely on our skills and not on social programs. We want to contribute to the economy, not rely on its benefits coming from taxpayers. We want less public spending, less bureaucracy, a smaller state and lower taxation. 
and we believe that the road for Europe to growth is certainly not an increase in public spending. Today's debts are tomorrow's taxes. That is why, to all the proponents of public spending, we just want to find a face to blame for austerity. We say that Margaret Thatcher once said, the bad thing with socialism is that eventually you run out of other people's money. And this is very true. So good luck in your debate today. Once again, thumbs up for Cass Athens, an idea for organizing the event. And thank you very much for hosting me on your screen today. Bye-bye. There is no doubt that austerity is going to have high social and political costs in the country it affects. Therefore, the question is whether it is going to achieve its goals and it is, whether it is the only way to get out, out of the current situation. When it comes to the first question, it has to be said that the main study which was used to justify austerity, the one by Reinhardt and Roganov, that said that debt levels are linked to slow economic growth, has actually been recently shown to be incorrect. And the authors themselves said that they never claimed that the social economic growth is caused by the debt levels. And some follow-up studies, such as by Dube, indicated that actually the slow economic growth contributes to the debt levels, and not the other way around, as the austerity proponents have been suggesting. Moreover, this evidence is consistent with evidence from other countries, United States included, that have been using funds, that have been using government funds, to get the economies going again and to get the countries out of the recessions through the, uh, boosting the confidence of, of people to spend and invest, as well as investing in the human capital, which helps to deal with unemployment, which is one of the biggest problems in the countries affected by austerity. Now, if austerity does not only do nothing about the debt levels, but also pushes the countries into the recession and makes it harder for them to repay their debts, Maybe it can still be argued that it is the only way to go. In the European Union context, this usually means that the other countries shouldn't be paying for the countries in economic hardships. However, if the goal is to get those countries to repay their debts, then by pushing them into recession through austerity, we are just punishing them for no apparent result whatsoever and also hurting ourselves in the first place too. And some people say we still have to do that to ensure that the countries do not accumulate debt again. However, European Union Economic and Monetary Union has already been redesigned to make sure that the situation like this does not happen again, which, by the way, also indicates that there were flaws in the original EMU design in the first place that contributed to the situation like that. And here, I might also add that in the light of these facts, I understand the dissatisfaction of people that think that they have to bear a high cost for something which was essentially the fault either the EMU of either European Union design or the fault of the bankers selling subprime mortgages that contributed to the financial crisis. Austerity is to bring public expenditure in line with fiscal income. Nowadays we talk about austerity in the context of um, extremely huge public deficits or extremely huge debt levels and we try to implement austerity measures in order to reduce public deficits. Usually austerity measures refer to um, cut expenditure or increase in taxes and are extremely unpopular in politics but also for the men on the street. Why is that like this? Well, um, one of the reasons is that um, austerity measures mean reducing the quantity of services and benefits provided by the government, which is not surprisingly um, not really popular. On the other hand, we should not ignore the benefits from public, um, from austerity measures in, in the long term. This would mean that low debt levels go hand in hand with low interest rates on sovereign debt. If we manage to, to do this, then we will have reduced costs for borrowing, which increases the scope for some other investments and have very positive effect on the economy. Another argument is that the interest payment on uh, sovereign debt made today is paid by generations tomorrow. This would mean that we should concentrate on austerity measures also for reason, reasons of intergenerational justice and um, like our moral duty is to pay attention also on the burden that we leave behind. Another very important strength of austerity measures is that um, they provide confidence and uh, 
um, sent a very important message to debtors and future investors in order that governments can um, deal with the current situation and are capable of dealing with the economic crisis. Well, uh, reducing debt deficits and uh, reducing debt and, and public deficits is uh, really essential. And I can try to explain that in other words, like imagine you want to lose weight, um, a smart thing to do is to, to eat less. But you can never maintain a healthy weight only by eating less. Um, good thing to do would be to do some sports and some fitness and to combine eating less with, uh, with some exercises. It is the same also with the economy. In times of huge deficits, um, austerity measures are extremely necessary and very important. But they have to be tackled with uh, some structural reforms, um, as for example, uh, reforms on labor markets or governments should uh, should should try to, to strengthen the competition in services or in the energy sector. Only then we can come back on the track of uh, sustainable economic growth and competitive economy. Okay, so uh, <laughs> now I take over and we start uh, our questions and answers. Um, we will do it like this, that we first uh, take a question uh, from, from you, then uh, we collect another question from Greece, and uh, the third question we collect uh, from Hamburg, and uh, then all of our speakers uh, get a chance to uh, respond to it, and yeah, of course, it would be the best way if you have a very specific question, and you can just uh, address it to one of our speakers. So, audi the audience, <laughs> it's up to you right now. Are there any questions and uh, what? Um, I will try to get to you very fast with the microphone. Well, if, uh, if not, uh, I, could, <laughs> I could go with, on with, with a question uh, I was uh, <laughs> asking myself. Um, and first, um, I would love to start uh, with uh, Carsten Owens, our first speaker, um, who uh, was uh, proposing austerity. Um, so, you um, told us a state uh, should save the money in times of regression, uh, but um, what about uh, the other positions, investments uh, to promote a public demand and to offering jobs which will lead to more demand in the, in the micro sector, I would say, by uh, all the people. So, you, you told us about flexibility and isn't that isn't that the way to keep a state or a society flexible? Oh no, so sorry, we just collect uh, the questions <laughs> and uh, we go, I give over, pass over to Greece um, and hopefully you get some questions to our speakers. You are still with us. <laughs> okay, so. Should we just start, or start uh, with uh, answering the first question, or I mean, I've, I've prepared another one. So. <laughs> I think in order to, to make it enrich it a bit. Okay. So, uh, well, I'd like to ask Mr. Owens uh, whether in this uh, austerity procedure is there an ending? I mean, is there a specific point where uh, global markets or governments find that austerity comes to an end and then there is a path for growth and uh, uh, public spending. Is there such a point in uh, his view over austerity in Europe? It's a very simple question. But what we've heard in the Netherlands, and presumably this has been mentioned sometime in Germany as well, is that actually we as uh, creditor nations are probably benefiting significantly more uh, from lending money to Greece right now and from having had the euro and cheap imports earlier, uh, or cheap spending, that we are now giving uh, to Greece in terms of money. Wouldn't that make it rational to make austerity less harsh than it is right now and make sure that people in Greece actually have enough food to eat and that kind of nice things? What speaker do you <laughs> like to, to answer to this question? So, uh, what? The propositions, okay. No questions to you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a sign of uh, <laughs> <laughs> more very convincing, I guess. 
Okay, so we start with the first uh, questions. question I was asking. Um, do you remember or shall I just uh, do a small repetition? Maybe oh. Just flexibility, how does that work without uh, public demand? Well, first of all, um, we have a demand on the market. So I pointed that out in, in my speech that uh, the Greek economy actually is regaining trust and that the markets are recovering. So it was just, I think, the, the uh, state old company that um, actually um, got a lot of money, hundreds of millions on the market. So it is actually possible without the state spending that money. So that is an important thing. If you would like to, to well, stay flexible as a government, no matter if it's a whole country or if it's just a small city, um, to, in order to keep this flexibility, you cannot always borrow money. Because that's what I said. Um, governments tend to borrow money in good times and in bad times. And they never, never ever stop this borrowing money process in the good times. But that, that is what we all do. Like when, when we need money to invest, for example, to build a house, of course, we borrow money from the bank. And after time, we, we repay our debt. So but that is not what sh well, history shows us uh, what governments do. So that's why borrowing more and more money as a government may work in the short run because you regain flexibility. But in the long run, you have an increase in debt, you have an increase in interest you need to pay, and therefore this is not an option. Thank you very much. And uh, I guess so we just take uh, the second questions, which as well was addressed to Carsten Owens, I guess. Do you need a small a short repetition or is it uh, do you have it in mind? So, start it. If I got it right, um, the difference in Greece was about the, the end of austerity. So, if there actually is an end, correct? Just not explicit? <laughs> yes, good. So, well, hopefully, of course, there is. And Carl Philip already pointed that out um, in, in his speech that actually um, we had this process here in Germany as well. And fortunately, we could take more time because the, the market pressure was less hard than it is these days for Greece. So that was uh, actually, well, we were just lucky, you could say, um, or we started early enough. But of course, there is an end of austerity policy or of consolidation of, of national households. Um, but therefore, you need to, at the very beginning, um, have some, some very, very um, hard reforms, yes. But then the market economy as a whole um, is regaining trust. And it's all, as we know, in, in business and in politics about trust. So as soon as markets are regaining trust and the Greek economy is actually showing that uh, the trust is coming back, um, even though it's still very difficult, as, as we all know. But um, yeah, at the, at the beginning, of course, reforms are hard. And budget cuts are even harder. Uh, if, People are affected directly and losing jobs, um, as is the case. But after some time, trust is um, well recovering, and the economy is recovering. So and then there is an end. So I think Paul Philip wanted to point out something on that question as well, if that's fine. Yeah, because I would, I would, I would disagree on that because uh, at, at the current, or uh, the, the current tactics. As I would describe them, in my opinion, leave, uh, have, haven't even uh, don't even have an end in sight because we don't act with a long time plan. What we are doing at the moment is pure firefighting. We are uh, limiting ourselves on emergency uh, uh, on emergency rescue packages, and we are only uh, hoping to survive the next month or the next year uh, uh, if, if if we if we look for the long term reasons. Um, what we are doing at the moment, or what we uh, are in danger to do, is to leave the countries by themselves. And uh, I would like to refer to your question as well, uh, when you mentioned that we should um, <clears throat> we should show solidarity because we benefited from the open market and we uh, exported our debt, or we exported our um, our capital uh, uh, overseas and, 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 and uh, had, had the free market in Greece and they consume our products and thereby uh, we have this debt. So yes, we have a European market, we have the European Union and this problem is a European problem which only can be solved uh, by European means and that, all, that also means for us Germans that yes, we have to pay 
for debts in other countries. And yes, we have to pay them because um, when we look at Germany 10 years ago, okay, we had a problem. We had uh, high unemployment and we had, uh, uh, our economy was, was, uh, was pretty weak, but still um, our recession rates uh, were very, very low compared to the recession rate, rates we have in Greece at the moment. And our un unemployment rate even then uh, was so low that you guys today would dream of, uh, of it. <laughs> um, uh, we, the, the situation is, is completely different. We speak of 60% of unemployed in Spain uh, 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 under, under, 20, uh, under 30. So um, this is a much bigger problem and those countries in Southern Europe I don't think uh, can help uh, themselves, which we at the moment want them to do. So um, we have to work on European solutions and we have to put uh, we have to, we have to help them by by giving money. Otherwise, I don't see an end of it. Thank you very much. And uh, I think the third question uh, it addresses to the proposition uh, speaker as well. But uh, no, uh, I, I guess it would be a nice idea to give uh, uh, to pass it over to Greece um, to let your proposition speaker answer to it. Yeah, would you uh, elaborate on the third question? Because I don't know what the third question is. Third question. Third question is what is the ending in this second? Third one about the ending? Okay, should we go? I mean, I think that I have the answer. If there is an end in a disaster policy, I think that, as I told before, it's a way of ending. It's a, it's a philosophy of, of how you try to balance your budget, it's like trying to balance your budget in your house. So we do the same in the economy. So I think that it is uh, a procedure that you need to be in mind every day if you want to have positive results, not only now, but in the near future and in the next generation. So I think that there is no end. Uh, maybe there is an end in the hard policies of austerity, but this way of thinking and political uh, philosophy and economic philosophy, I think that needs to be something stable in, uh, in the, the mentality, not only of the government, but also of the society. Um, in my opinion, there is no end to the process. Uh, let me remind you um, a very famous and important economist, novelist, Amartya Sen. Try many times to explain why it's impossible to have economic growth and progress without democracy. And uh, if you don't keep these two things together, I think it's impossible to go out of this process. And for example, we can see that if you take it on Greece, my country, we have uh, a number of phenomena that uh, develop that in fact Greece enters into a new model called illiberal democracy. So what are these elements of this illiberal Greek democracy? First of all, poor, poor rule of law, so a bit of that, which means poor, poor protection of civil rights and of uh, uh, contract rights, of uh, 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 employment rights also. High income uh, inequality. Uh, this is also a similar risk. This is a new uh, Decline in the effectiveness of uh, the government, poor tax contents, expansion of the shadow economy, uh, which explodes since the beginning of the uh, austerity uh, uh, measures of protection. Uh, difficulties in the tax collection, there is no progress also on this field. Slow growth of government revenue and expansion also. Government failure to redistribute openly. In favor of the poor social groups, no problems also on this sector. Um, uh, weak institutions, very weak institutions, public institutions. Uh, favor of the government also to provide needed public goods, which means low order health care, et cetera, education, etc. So, where, where is the success of this, uh, this success story? I said, as, as, uh, our country. We are in process of All these elements show that in fact we are in a we live in an illiberal Greek.
I can move to the second round. Do you want to try something? Because we're going to be in the second round the first time. Actually, I would disagree about that. Because there's a lot of reasons not to speak out. I would take another set of questions and then. Oh, it has to be this answer. I do with something. We heard a lot of uh, reasons for not being mad about this. For, uh, for example, you said about the difficulties of tax collection. I think that this is not because of state policy. This is something usual in Greece in the last 50 years. Uh, it's not because of state policy. I think it's because of the disability of uh, the Greek public administration, the Greek political leaders also, especially the Greek political leaders, to implement and uh, create uh, a trustful tax collection system in order to succeed the targets, not because of the state policy. But, uh, okay, then. Um, I would like to make some remarks before we move to the second round, just to boost up a little bit of conversation with the whole guy, since I'm German and I want to make it more hot for me. Uh, I want to grab two points. The first one is about uh, household uh, settings and theory, which I found irresistible for economics. And I think that maybe it's the reason that, I, that why most of the people involved in this is a bit uh, this, uh, difficult to ask questions. I think the, the main reason that we don't see uh, both of these to be very active on questions is that we feel like finance and the economy is a bit uh, autonomous in the political sphere. And uh, this is an issue we have to address. And I would want to ask you not to be afraid to ask questions about this because it's not a matter of just defining a financial theory whether austerity is good or bad. It's about our lives. If we have austerity or not, uh, it ruins life, it ruins people's life, it can ruin your life. So feel free to ask and feel free to to take part in this battle. Uh, do we have any, any questions about that? Yes, hello. Hey, I have a question. We said the word mentality. And to be with, I know we can point it. We are people that uh, it's not associated for us to stay on in our league, as we say. Uh, even today, uh, um, Greeks uh, go out to uh, in a restaurant, try to antagonize one another as to who pays the bill. That's the Greek mentality. Can we change? Do you think that austerity uh, can change this? Education can change this? Thank you. I think it's a question for the uh, proposition speakers of both countries. Okay. So we can restart with Greece or Hamburg? Well, one question or two. Come on, okay, okay. No, I guess any questions in the audience? No, no. Okay, we got one question. We have also a question in Hamburg? Yeah. That's great. Yes. <laughs> So okay, your question first, and then I want to move back. Um, it's to the sorry, um, it's to the contra side, Mr. Schuppe. Um, you mentioned that um, more general a state should invest in the in the time of crisis in the state and um, pay the debt back uh, when the economic is um, stronger and progressing. Um, but how do you do you ensure that the state really um, pays its debt um, in good times. Um, as we know, states tend to react very slow on problems, so how do you ensure that? Thank you. So if there are aren't um, any questions mm -hmm. left, mm -hmm. I think we start with answering the first question. And now we'll, wait. we'll have one more question. Okay. We have a set. Okay, and the black part, the proposition, the black does see the proposition because of the effects of austerity and first in the situation of the second and third tier system, and third, the political uh, system, the political system, but I take into consideration that uh, the rise of COVID-19. That's a false start. Okay, so we have a question. Yes, yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, 
Could you just repeat the question? Quality is uh, not, not very yeah, good. The question so was uh, how did the opposition uh, members find the uh, kind of in uh, education, healthcare system, and the political system, and especially the rise of the Golden Dawn, the extreme right party. And that goes to the proposition uh, speakers, I guess. So we we start with the first question in Greece. Would you like to answer? Okay. Uh, uh, regarding the the mentality, the Greek mentality that uh, needs uh, to be changed, I think that we must change some of the elements of our mentality. These elements, which are superficial, let's say, let's say that. For example, to try to persuade ourselves that we are rich, but we are not. Uh, the, the, these elements which make us uh, to, to be in a superficial atmosphere, knowing that uh, there is no tomorrow, just today, without caring for the next, gener next uh, generations, and uh, taking only into account our personal benefits and our uh, personal uh, needs. Just now, not tomorrow. This is something that I think that needs to be changed. Otherwise, we cannot survive. We, and after that, the Greek society needs to understand that all these decades, especially the four last decades, we lived a life extremely different than not only we deserve, but also we had manners. You know, we were unable to manage this kind of life. And now we pay, unfortunately, we pay the damages and the wrong mis and the mistakes and the wrong policies of all these decades. And I am afraid that these current generation and after after this generation, the next generation, will be the the people, the youth, which uh, will take the biggest uh, uh, impact, negative impact to this uh, uh, extremely uh, unpopular at least policy. I'm not sure that this is the right way to put the, the question. Uh, the thing is, what to say that we should have a kind of modernization of the social attitude in Greece. This is the really problem. I mean, I don't like uh, this cliche that Greeks are a Greeks on that. Greeks can be very productive, and uh, we are hard workers, so uh, I really don't like this much. So I'm almost quick and I am on board with it a long time now. And uh, I mean, uh, we are trying to do uh, our best in, my, uh, uh, in our profession. Uh, so, um, this kind of generalization, so I don't think that this is the, the, the way to go out of this very, very difficult situation. Um, in fact, the question is to, the real question to, to put on the table is to answer our to first question ourselves and also also our, our partners if uh, the game if the European game uh, is uh, is a fair game we should not forget that the, uh, Germany France and other Central European countries continue to borrow uh, with a very low rate interest okay and this is very very profitable for their economies. We should not forget that Germany has a very successful and more now than before the, the outputs of the price, a very successful expansionist commercial policy. And uh, this is also a problem for the European common market. There is no common market anymore. And if we continue to, 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 to deal uh, like this uh, uh, with, uh, with what we call it before common commercial policy. So, Maybe we should rethink the rules of the European Union uh, in order to try to put uh, um, moral principles uh, uh, directly uh, uh, concerning the social or just of populations, because this is not the right way to, to create that uh, solidarity and cooperation between uh, uh, European states. Okay, um, I would like to uh, answer your question first then as well. Uh, 
refer a bit to what Felipe just said because I think it connects. Um, you asked how we ensure that in good times uh, the countries or the governments save the money. Well, um, I think uh, uh, we should use the two solutions Felipe mentioned in her speech, which are democracy and the rule of law. Um, now, first of all, yes, uh, democracy can be a critical approach because um, we, are, we, we know that, that uh, democratic elections can also uh, bring governments into power that keep spending. We, as we say in Germany, today's promises before an election are tomorrow's debts. But um, as, as, as we said, we have a common market, we have a common currency, and in the end it should be indeed Brussels who should, uh, who should look after our governments and, and make, them, make them save money responsibly. However, this is not the case in the current situation. In the current situation, we're strangling the economies. We are leaving the countries alone. We don't have a common approach for the whole Eurozone. We, we look at the whole problem from a national perspective, and that has to end. Yes, we have to give up some of our uh, fiscal sovereignty to a centralized organization. On the other hand, this organization has to be democratically controlled as well, uh, which, uh, which I would hope to ensure by strengthening, strengthening the European Parliament. But this is, this is in the end, uh, the solution. Have clear rules like we have uh, with a, with a six-pack or with a, with a debt break in Germany that prevent uh, democratically elect uh, governments from too much spending. On the other hand, leave them as many room as possible to ensure that the people have the, have the last word in here. Thank you very much. And there was a third and last question left from Greece, I guess. Uh, yeah, uh, regarding the question about the uh, going down investigation cuts, uh, as I said before, austerity must be combined with social protection measures, which conclude educate, public education and health system uh, budget. And being with development policies for attracting investments and uh, focusing on the innovation and the cooperative and other things coming. So I think that this that didn't happen in Greece. We can only austerity policy without these two very important elements, at least until today. So I think that bottom down partly was uh, increased uh, uh, percentages because uh, of this lack of uh, policy. But also, Golden Down focuses on and based on in one more element. This is a political element. It has to do with the systemic unemployment, the systemic lack of opportunities, of the, especially for the young people. It has to do with the corrupt political system. All this didn't create because of austerity policy. Where before, and are now, and will be exist, unfortunately, because I don't see that uh, a big change will be done to change next one or two months. So, partly the increasement of the golden down is explained because of this state policy, which is not implemented correctly at all in Greece, and partly because of these political systemic problems of Greece in the, for the last three years. Thank you very much. Um, well, I, I think this will also be the ending uh, of uh, our events. Yes. Uh, I would like to ask a, a, a last question. For the Since uh, most of them are connected uh, the issue of state with the And I think that it's a total, uh, it's a total mistake to do that. Because uh, uh, if we see that only in numbers, I think that uh, the United States have a, a huge debt. Japan has a debt which is 200% of its GDP. And uh, there's only a couple of weeks that uh, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe announced a very generous uh, problem of public spending. So uh, I suppose that global markets, when they have to give credit to some countries, they don't take in uh, mind only the percentage of debt. The question to me, it's purely political and it's uh, connected to the European Union and um, whether Germany will accept uh, a euro bond. And in this political distribution, in this game uh, theory, what Germany will uh, get to give 
its acceptance to the euro bond so that global markets eventually stop having uh, stop focusing on the issues of the eurozone. Do you have any uh, idea or any feeling on how this procedure is going to continue after the German election and whether are we going to see a dramatic change in the architecture of the European project? This is a question for all the speakers. Okay. Who likes to start? Do you have a conclusion you'd like to give? Yeah, so Kast always like to start to answer. I think our Chancellor Angela Merkel, um, she made it quite clear quite a while um, already ago, as she said, uh, no euro bonds as long as she lives. Um, that was quite a hard argument. And uh, well, of course, we all hope, uh, hopefully in Greece as well, that uh, she is expecting quite a long life, a healthy life, and the uh, third legislature is starting this September. No, but um, seriously, so. Philip will probably say, uh, yes, of course, we will accept euro bonds, but no, I think this is not an option, and it's, it is uh, as well not the solution, because we, we have the um, common currency, and the, the euro shows, um, in, well, in, in comparison to the global markets, that is a stable currency, and that there is no need for euro bonds. What we need, and that's what Carl Philip already mentioned, um, is an institution on the European level that actually has the right to um, check and to control the households of the member states of the euro. So that is what we need. And uh, we need measures and, and rules to actually well act if countries are not following the rules of the convergence criteria, as we mentioned earlier today. So that is what we need, but no euro bonds. Thank you. Okay, I think that uh, euro bonds could become a reality only if German and French socialists decide to recreate the German-French uh, uh, axis and try to work very, very hard in order to, to have a, a common strategy in favor of Europe. And in this case, it will be possible. Well, uh, of course I hope that we will have a change in German politics uh, after the elections. Um, and, uh, well, I, I think we, but I think we even might have a, cha a, cha a change in German politics if Angela Merkel wins the third term, because uh, in the long term I don't see any alternative to Germany giving way more. And by giving way more I mean uh, also to have some kind, I, I, I wouldn't say the word Eurobonds right now, but some kind of measurements that takes the uh, the interest, uh, the pressure of interest from the southern European countries. Um, there is the possibility to have uh, so-called debt reconciliation bonds uh, that are limited only to debt reduction. This is a, a, a short-term measurement I would strongly uh, strongly support. There are so-called project bonds which can be taken by as well a European uh, institution to invest in certain projects like uh, energy uh, uh, business in Greece, for example, with solar energy or other, uh, other business to, uh, to fight youth unemployment. Uh, we will also have direct uh, investments uh, from Europe, um, by, for example, with the European Structural or uh, the European Social Funds. And I think, yes, on a long-term way, uh, on a long-term perspective, we also will have euro bonds because uh, everything else wouldn't make any sense because we have a common currency, we have a common economy and we will also have, by long term, we will have a centralized uh, economic governance. We will have a common European tax policy, we will have a common European labor policy. We will experience in Europe that we have a centralization of economic and, and other policies as well, by the way. Um, hopefully then with a more democratic union and the very, very uh, small uh, level by strengthening municipalities. I think the national states will become more and more important, uh, less and less important. Um, but the, 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 the euro bonds as a whole uh, will be a long-term perspective. What we now have to focus on is uh, lowering the debt, and I think that the debt conciliation bonds 
they are a measurement we should, uh, we should at least take into uh, consideration. I think it is highly negligent to uh, oppose them from the start. Um, I think that nowadays we are in a process of creating uh, new institutions, European institutions like ESM uh, within, within the European Union, so as to help the weak countries and the weak EU members to uh, satisfy their debt, uh, so as to uh, do all these uh, structural reforms for their political system and of course for their economy. So this is a very good step, I think, for the European Union. But if a country uh, follows strictly the state policy, if a country is emphasized in the development policy, implementing innovation, in order to competitive uh, advantages of uh, their economy, I think that there is well, no need for uh, a Europe to go to this country, you must have the need to go away. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for this fruitful conversation. I think it's good when we leave with more questions than we came. And uh, just to remind us, uh, Cass Adams has two more debates uh, on the issue, on the current issue. So uh, stay tuned, and uh, we hope to do talk again. Thank you.